all of you ladies and gentlemen to this prestigious conference of Salvesco 2023 it is indeed a pleasure to be present amongst the stalwarts of ECMO and critical care first of all we would like to have the uh, introduction session by dr vivek gupta to just briefly tell us about today's session i write to you sir good morning to everybody uh, first of all welcome to ludhiana the manchester of india i uh, welcome you all all the faculty who has come all the way from us uk singapore middle east countries everyone along with the delegates who has made all the way our chairpersons and other faculty from the india so i welcome you all to this conference i hope uh, faculty stay and travel was not a big issue though it was uh, far from the airports but i'm sure that we have tried to make it very convenient and uh, i welcome you all and i hope uh, all the sessions will go smoothly and uh, we will enjoy the sessions and we will learn from here so that we can achieve our objective of this conference that learn we are learning and we go back and we practice we share our knowledge so that we can enhance and improve our practices so that it more can help us to sustain many more lives which we have seen in past 17 18 years in the country and across the world thank you very much so i uh, request dr sundar to proceed for the academic session so now with no further delays let's begin with our scientific program the first session for today is on the topic critical care and echo under which we'll uh, uh, have various talks from various speakers so to moderate the session we'll first invite on stage dr ramanathan kr next up to moderate the session we have dr dinesh gupta i would like to have dr narayana radhan pundi for on the stage i would like to welcome dr sandeep kundra on the stage I welcome everybody so now let's begin with the session morning everyone uh, uh, welcome to all uh, it's it's really uh, good to see you all at swack so this morning at ludhiana i should thank um, at the outset the organizers for having done a wonderful job getting you all here uh, for this big conference um we are straight away uh, on to our first session on time and uh, clearly the speaker for the first talk um is uh, dr huda al faudri she is going to talk on uh, uh, management of pregnant patients on ecmo to introduce huda um huda is the um head of department of anesthesia critical care and pain management at al adan hospital uh, ministry of health kuwait um huda over to you thank you very much good morning everybody thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me here today uh, i'm going to talk to you about ecmo and pregnancy uh, so in the next 15 minutes or so i'm going to go through the critical illness in pregnancy going through a literature review on ECMO and pregnancy and its outcome, ECMO and pregnancy for COVID-19, and I'm going to go through some common indications for using ECMO during pregnancy and some special considerations that we might need to take. So critical illness during pregnancy um, is not common. The incidence of critical illness in pregnancy is uh, less than 3 per 1,000 maternities. and the rate of obstetric admissions out of all icu admissions is also very low it's between 1 and 1/2 to 9 per 1000 icu admissions so whether you work in obstetrics in labor ward or whether you work in intensive care unit you will not encounter the sick obstetric patients um that much uh the mortality of these sick patients is also very low it's around 12 per 100000 maternities Uh, and then if you take those that actually require ECMO out of the sick population it's even less than that so the main message out of here is that we're not going to see these patients that often and therefore maybe we don't have many experience in dealing with them so most of these data come um, from the UK uh, with regards to the incidence and one of the best sources of data for obstetric patients is the national maternity and perinatal audit um and uh, here you can see the incidence is 2.24 and 2.75 for admission to the critical care uh, both in the first immediate period postpartum and uh, uh, up to one year postpartum uh, and in this the, from the same source uh, the most common indication for admission to the intensive care unit is actually obstetric hemorrhage uh, 
uh, followed by pneumonia. Uh, and if you take all the septic patients that are admitted to critical care, uh, pneumonia accounts actually for almost half of these patients. Uh, and these are the patients that will end up probably needing ECMO. With regards to VA ECMO, uh, cardiac disease would be the indication for that, obviously, and this is the fifth commonest cause for admission to the intensive care unit. So what about ECMO and pregnancy? So uh, there are few recommendations to using ECMO from international bodies. Uh, for example, the Embrace report, which is the longest running audit in the UK looking at maternal mortality and morbidity, is recommending using ECMO referral for peripartum ARDS. The Fetal Maternal Med Medicine Society, the Obstetric Anesthesia Association also does the same recommendation. And most of these are coming from case report and case series with few multi center uh, retrospective analyses and systematic reviews on specific infections in pregnancy. So if we look at this publication here in SIO from 2015, they did a literature review uh, finding 31 reports involving 67 patients. Majority were VB, ECMO, uh, 49 patients compared to 18 VA. Uh, and the maternal survival was around 80% and fetal survival was 70% with no evidence of major hemorrhage. Uh, in this other systematic review from uh, IJOA, um, they identified 90 publications involving 97 patients up to 2018. Uh, majority here, though, were uh, BA ECMO type, uh, indications being pulmonary embolism and peripartum cardiomyopathy, and then the minority were BV ECMO type, and the most common indication for that was ARDS. Again, very good uh, maternal survival rate, reaching 90% and neonatal of 83%. Um, we've got extensive data also from the ELSO International Registry in this retrospective analysis, was, which looked over a 20 years period that identified 280 patients with an overall maternal survival reaching 70%. And the interesting thing here is that the rate of survival is actually increasing over the 20 years period. The risk factors that were identified uh, uh, for uh, mortalities were included uh, having ECPR, uh, the duration on ECMO, and developing renal complications on ECMO. This systematic review and meta-regression analysis uh, looked at even longer period of time, almost 50 years, uh, involving 143 publications, including nine observational studies that address pregnant and postpartum patients, for VB and VA, and the pooled maternal survival was again 77% and poor fetal survival of 69%. There was no significant correlation, however, between cardiac and pulmonary indications and maternal survival, unlike the non-pregnant adult population, where we know the BV ECMO outcome is much better than the VA. Uh, there were hemorrhagic complications identified, being the most commonly reported as uterine bleeding, intra-abdominal and cannulation site bleeding. Now, what about ECMO and COVID-19? In the USA, 200, over 200,000 pregnant and peripartum women were affected by COVID uh, with an associated um, death of 0.14%. Pregnant or peripartum women with COVID-19, when they compared them to those without COVID-19, or even with those who are not pregnant with COVID-19, uh, both of these groups, they had a uh, higher incidence of preterm birth, preeclampsia, cesarean delivery, perinatal death, ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and ECMO. Um, <clears throat> in this retrospective course study of ELSA International Registry, again, uh, they looked at uh, all adult women more than 18 years with COVID-19 on VV ECMO, in one year's period during the COVID pandemic, it included 213 international centers, over 36 countries, and they looked at survival to hospital discharge and ECMO related complications. What they identified is 1,180 female patients who had VD ECMO, 1,080 were non pregnant, and 100 were pregnant. The survival in the pregnant group was 84%, so again, high survival rate versus 51.5% for the non pregnant population and no difference in duration of one 
the complications in the pregnant group uh, involved uh, having a lower incidence of renal complications, possibly due to high nitric oxide and progesterone during pregnancy. There were no new complications and few bleeding complications. Now, the interesting thing, if we compare the two also registry data, the first one, which looked over 20 years, there were 280 patients, and the second one, which was over one year, there was 100 patients. So you can see the dramatic increase in the number of patients, as well as in the survival rate, being 70% pre-COVID and 84% post-COVID. So things are improving both in number and also in the outcome. So what are the indications for uh, ECMO? For BB ECMO, the most common indication is ARDS, uh, mostly due to pneumonia of the different types, viral, bacterial, and aspiration. Trali is another common indication, because you know, remember these patients do end up with major hemorrhage as a complication, and hence receiving major transfusion, and therefore probably developing trali. And they do have usually a good, quite good response. Uh, VA ECMO, on the other hand, the commonest uh, indication is uh, fluid embolism, either pulmonary or amniotic, cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, and uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, and as well as going into eCPR if the patient develops cardiac arrest. So, what are the special considerations that we have to make for this group of patients? There are a number of questions that we're still not sure what the answer is. Cannulation, for example, what's the best cannulation method? Shall we go uh, double lumen cannulation in the internal jugular, avoiding the groin area, considering the gravid uterus is there, uh, and the risk of infection, etc.? Uh, or are we okay to go for fem drug or fem fem cannulation? The position of the patient can we prone this patient or can we not, considering again the physiological changes that might happen with proning them? And also remembering the left lateral tilt, which is required for these type of patients for the hemodynamic effects. Shall we wake these patients up or shall we keep them asleep? Uh, can we mobilize them and how far can we mobilize them considering they are pregnant? What medication can we give them? Uh, are they um, uh, considering the effect on the fetal well-being and also the fetal considerations with regards to monitoring uh, while they're on ECMO before the delivery of the baby? What's the optimal time of delivery and how long uh, can they go on ECMO? And we can't forget the social factors as well, involving the family and the baby, uh, uh, considering their young population. And, you know, it's usually a big shock to the family once they become sick in such a short period of time. So I'm going to give you some of our experience. Uh, since the literature there is not, you know, there is not much there about how um, we should manage these patients. So one of the experiences comes from Adam uh, ICLS Center. Uh, where we've done 13 cases uh, of pregnant patients, five were antipartum and, uh, sorry, eight antipartum and five postpartum, with an uh, overall survival rate of 66.6% and an antipartum survival rate of 75%. So it's much higher antipartum survival rate. But the reason for that is you can see we had quite few ECPRs in the postpartum period, mostly due to uh, pulmonary embolism and aneurysm fluid embolism. Uh, this is another center experience, which is a bigger center experience in Kuwait from Al Jahra Hospital. Uh, it, was, it looked at um, uh, all obstetric patients uh, that had uh, ECMO in the period between September 2020 to May 21, involving 29 pregnant patients. 18 of them were mechanically ventilated, and 10 received ECMO. Uh, eight were BB, so majority was BB, and two had hybrid configuration. Half of them were postpartum and half of them were antipartum. And out of the five antipartum, three had caesarean sections and one had fetal death and one continued her pregnancy till she was decannulated and was discharged home and came back for a caesarean section at term. Pony was done in two postpartum only, uh, rest were antipartum and one uh, had pneumothorax. So the median ventilation days prior to ECMO was three days, so it was done quite early, uh, the decision to put them on ECMO. The median ECMO run was 24 days, which is longer than the usual ECMO run, but maybe not for the COVID patients. Fetal monitoring was done for these patients, uh, well, through fetal heart tone assessment twice per day, and pelvic ultrasound was done as required to check the fetal maturity to aid the decision for uh, delivery of the baby. Uh, 
Patients were mostly working up by day two to four and were allowed to be extubated. And this was um, uh, a um, reducing the amount of medication and sedation they were getting and allowing the patients to be mobilized initially to the edge of the bed and then eventually around the ICU. And these are the data from the center. And you can see most of the patients received uh, prior to ECMO muscle relaxation and nitric oxide with some receiving prone positioning. With regards to the cannulation, most of the patients received the TREM drug cannulation. One of them had double lumen cannulation. Um, uh, there were no problem with uh, cannulation in regards to kind of access uh, and also maintaining of the flow uh, with this kind of configuration, saying that uh, the double lumen cannulation was much favorable, especially for the physiotherapist, for the mobilization, uh, especially with those that were working up. Um, if it was uh, feasible. And the overall survivor for this group of patients was 90% maternal and neonatal. Only one patient died after developing intrauterine death where the baby was uh, uh, you know, lost and the patient developed multi-organ failure later on and died from sepsis. So tips to take from this uh, experience. Um, we tend to do large access cannula to ensure that you have good ECMO flow. Remember, the uh, pregnant woman have a high cardiac output, and if she's developed sepsis, then she will even have higher cardiac output, and you need to meet that with your ECMO flow. So make sure you have good size cannula to allow you a good flow. Uh, the delivery of the baby was decided by fetal maturity, so ultrasound assessment for fetal weight and gestational age. Um, and once they're more than 30 weeks, uh, they would get a cesarean section. Unless you're expecting a quick improvement, then uh, they would be uh, kept pregnant, like one of the cases. Uh, heparin articulation was used with few complications uh, involving one patient developing retroperitoneal hematoma uh, following cesarean section with abdominal compartment syndrome. Um, and uh, one had gum bleeds following thrombolysis for PE. Um, social factors were also encountered for this group of patients where uh, obviously, these patients being COVID, you know, once they delivered, uh, then they want to see their baby, and there was this issue of bringing the baby into them. So we kind of managed this with using the um, technology, so showing photos and videos of the babies. We managed to get one of the incubators at the side, at the end of the ICU bed, where they could actually see them across the glass. Uh, and um, one of the patients, actually, I'll show you a picture in a minute, we saw her following that after recovery. And this is the only thing she remembers, <laughs> that the day that we brought the baby to her, when she woke up and she remembered that moment till now. That's the thing that she remembered when she saw me first thing. So the take-home message, ECMO pregnancy is feasible and safe with improving survival rate. The maternal survival rate is between 72 to 91 percent, with a fetal survival rate between 65 and 83 percent. There are special considerations that you need to take for ECMO pregnancy. And we definitely need future research to focus on the choice of cannulation, the fetal monitoring, the method of delivery, and the optimal timing of delivery, as well as long-term outcome. And I would like to end with some positive advice. These are some photographs of our ECMO survivors from the pregnant population with the babies that they were pregnant with. Uh, so we met them, you know, uh, about a year or two after. And uh, they were all looking healthy and happy with their spouses and their children. And uh, finally, I'd like to end my talk uh, by inviting you all to Kuwait in February 15 to 17 of next year for SWAC Council meeting in Kuwait. So please mark your calendar. Uh, we'll have pre-conference workshops on the 13th to 14th as well. So hope to see you all there next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for, that, for uh, that excellent talk. You've covered the A to Z of um, the evidence and uh, your experience with uh, ECMO and pregnant patients. Um, we'll take the questions at the end of the session. Um, after all the speakers have uh, done their talks, uh, over to you today. And good morning to all. Uh, managing patients with septic shock is a challenge for everyone. And we lose a lot of patients with septic shock. Uh, we have amongst us uh, Graham McLaren from National University Hospital, Singapore. And his area of interest is ECMO and infection cardiac critical care, he has more than 200 publications and special achievements, he's the president of ESO. Over to you, 
Graham McClure. I just have one disclosure, which is I uh, have the privilege of being the current uh, president of ELSO. So I need to be clear from the beginning what I am talking about and what I'm not talking about. What I am talking about is the use of ECMO for mechanical circulatory support in septic shock. I'm not talking about the use of ECMO in general sepsis patients who may have ulcerative organ failure, may have components of respiratory failure. And I quote from the fourth edition of the Red Book here, and uh, from the redoubtable Giles Peake, who emphasizes that if you're putting an ECMO patient on ECMO for respiratory failure, it doesn't matter what the anotrope dose is, it doesn't matter what the echo looks like, you should put them on VV echo. So I'm not talking about those patients. I'm talking about those who were putting on venoarterial arterial ECMO as mechanical circuitry support. I'm also not talking about the use or the evolution of infection during ECMO. What I am talking about is the use of ECMO up front for somebody with refractory septic shock. So I will not be talking about nosocomial infections during ECMO, although in passing I mentioned that they are significant across all age groups and are associated with increased mortality in the largest series. The problem of definitions in sepsis uh, remains an issue. Uh, you may remember, if you cast your minds back about a decade, that uh, various groups set out to prove that systemic inflammatory response criteria used in the older definitions of sepsis were not predictive of death. And that was established quite firmly. And this was one of the steps that led toward the evolution of sepsis 3 in adult patients. Obviously, sepsis 3 is not validated or used in children, although the principle is there. But what current sepsis definitions are attempting to do is move away from SERS or sorry, sepsis as a diagnostic tool and use it as a prognostic tool. So sepsis 3 was published seven years ago, but nothing equivalent in children has been published. Nonetheless, the same steps have been taken, and hopefully we'll get there soon. The study on the right that you can see was published five years ago. It was an analysis of the ANZIX registry in Australia and New Zealand, which looked at about 2,500 admissions in children due to infection and found, again, that systemic inflammatory response criteria are not predictive of death. It's the degree of multi-organ failure that's predictive of death, and this is important to remember. Again, I'm going to focus on adults and children because I think it's important to understand how they influence each other and how the paradigms can be applied to the other group. So if we think about the potential role of ECMO in septic shock, it's important that we recognize that in children, multi-organ failure is very different than in adult patients. If most adult patients they come into intensive care, they're resuscitated, and amongst those who die, it's usually several days or weeks later from refractory multi-organ failure or complications of intensive care. That is not the case in children. Amongst children who are going to die from septic shock, half of them die in the first 24 to 48 hours. And if you think about trying to do research into that field, whatever you're researching is going to have to work blindingly quickly in order to stop half of those children dying in the first one to two days. And I think of the few candidates that are out there, ECMO may be one of them. Obviously, ECMO is not a treatment, it's a life support. Nonetheless, it can arrest, or so it's a bad choice of words, it can stop patients uh, dying so quickly and stabilize them in order to facilitate other treatment, even simple treatments like antibiotics. Most adult clinicians don't understand or appreciate that there are different hemodynamic patterns of septic shock because all they ever see is distributive shock, which is characterized by tachycardia, dilation of the systemic ventricle, and an increase in cardiac output. That is not the case in young children. Most babies uh, with septic shock develop right heart failure and persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. Slightly older children, perhaps at the age of two or three, develop isolated left ventricular dysfunction, so which can be hard to distinguish from myocarditis. Uh, in older patients, we would call this the septic cardiomyopathy. And then, of course, by adolescence, then the near universal pattern is distributive shock. But you can't predict just by the age of the patient, and it's important to recognize that these can change over time. 
So just talking about children for a second, uh, there were some uncontrolled case theories back in the early 1990s which overturned this idea that, that ECMO was contraindicated in septic shock. And then the field kind of died down for a number of years until 2007, where this report from the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne came out, uh, showing that uh, the majority of children could survive, which wasn't something that was uh, necessarily accepted at the time, and that central cannulation appeared to be associated with better survival. And also that uh, almost all of the survivors had good long-term outcomes. This was followed then by a series of looking just at central ECMO cannulation, which demonstrated uh, that higher flow as well as central cannulation might be associated with better outcomes because less differential hypoxemia and higher flow rates may reverse shock faster. That when this technology was applied in these you know, small children, that they didn't need ECMO for very long, um, and in general, they needed it very early after admission to PICU. But by using central cannulation, there appeared to be a survival to hospital discharge rate of about 75%. The principles here were that we used the largest cannulas possible. Um, if you just look at those adolescent children who were cannulated centrally, you get a 56 French atrial cannula in. Obviously, that's impossible to get in peripheral veins, even in the vena cava. So these are very, very large cannulas, very, very high flow rates. And perhaps this reverses shock faster. In these children, we don't want to pick numbers out of thin air and apply them like a cookbook. We want to adjust them and individualize them. And the targets that we're using are the same that you would use in septic shock patients who weren't on ECMO. You want to uh, restore uh, a normal lactate level. You want to restore central or mixed venous oxygen saturation and as is possible in children, you can reverse evolving multi-organ failure, re-establish uh, good renal function, etc. Other important principles of ECMO apply, as you would expect, resting the lung, uh, not using the ventilator for, for carbon dioxide clearance, but relying on the oxygenator. And if there's DIC present, let controlled anticoagulation guide circuit anticoagulation, not uh, the coagulopathy. In terms of safeguards, obviously, if you're using high flow central ECMO, uh, then you can risk spinning the pump too fast and causing hemolysis. So we use either pressure monitoring and avoid extreme sort of negative pressure. We measure plasma for hemoglobin regularly. And the third point, when I say run the pump at lower speeds, I don't mean run un unsatisfactory uh, pump speeds. I mean optimize the load loading conditions. The centrifugal pumps are obviously preload and afterload dependent. So what we want to do is maximize the uh, ECMO flow uh, at the lowest possible pump speed, which means proper control of preload and afterload on the pump. Another important point, particularly after hours, is team training, because you may not have an experienced ECMO consultant uh, in the ICU 24 hours a day, uh, depending on your model of care. So it's important that those people who are there know what to do uh, in response to fluctuations in flow and circuit chatter. And what you want to avoid are uh, huge fluid boluses being given constantly overnight. This is one example of a baby on ECMO. Uh, those of you who are tuned to this may recognize that this drainage cannula that you see is actually torted along its own axis, so it's twisted overnight. And this didn't go uh, appreciated by the staff on overnight, and so their response to perpetual decreases in ECMO flow was to give the baby more than 100 mils per kilogram of fluid loading, which of course would fix the problem for a few minutes and then it would recur. And if you look at what the surgeon did the next morning, which was just to untort the cannula, that was the root cause of the problem. So it's important that you and your team go through these issues so that the wrong treatment isn't given, uh, particularly to avoid uh, extremes of fluid overload, which may delay decannulation. I think this is probably the last major study in pediatric septic shock in ECMO. So this was a study we did uh, looking again at the ANSIX registry. We had over 5,000 children admitted with a diagnosis of sepsis to ICUs in Australia and New Zealand, uh, only 80 of whom were supported on VA ECMO for septic shock. Now the graph on the right looks somewhat confusing, but it's trying to illustrate an important principle. 
which is it's comparing the probability of death using a model, a prediction model, versus um, the actual death rate. So what it demonstrates is that if the child had about a less than 50% risk of death and ECMO was used, then the ECMO use was associated with an increase in mortality, not a decrease. But if the predicted risk of death was more than 50%, then ECMO had a protective effect and reduced mortality. So this is the only study in literature, to my knowledge, which tries to identify a cutoff point at which ECMO might be useful. Now, obviously, it's uh, constrained by the model that was used and perhaps by uh, local practices in Australia and New Zealand. But I think the principle is true, which is that we don't use ECMO early in the algorithm for septic shock. It's really something that should be used at the very end, but before irreversible damage or cardiac arrest sets in. Another point that this uh, study demonstrated was that central cannulation, again, was associated with lower mortality. So in pediatrics, we have guidelines which support the use of ECMO for refractory septic shocks. This is the American College of Critical Care Medicine guidelines uh, back in 2017. And more recently, the Pediatric Surviving Sepsis Guidelines, published in 2020, which acknowledging that the evidence is weak uh, and uh, the recommendation is weak, but nonetheless, the principle is there and there is some evidence to support this. Uh, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis back in 2020, which looked at um, children supported on beta bacteria like morphoseptic shock, and were able to demonstrate that about two-thirds of them survive. What about adult septic shock? Well, prior to that year, 2020, we had a group of studies, almost all of which were from Asia, and using ECMO for distributive shock all with terrible outcomes. These are a very sick group of patients. Nearly half of them in a couple of the studies had had a cardiac arrest. So it's not surprising that their outcomes were bad. Uh, the questions were asked at the time, why are we trying to use ECMO for distributive shock? Because obviously ECMO is short-term replacement for the heart and the lungs. It doesn't address the problems in the peripheral vasculature nor the mitochondria. So to me, it was somewhat like trying to shout slam a square peg through a round hole. But in 2013, investigators from Le Petit so Petit Hospital in Paris had a small case series which demonstrated much better outcomes. And this was for young adults with sepsis-induced low cardiac output, in other words, septic cardiomyopathy. And this was the only adult study which demonstrated perhaps what one could regard as encouraging outcomes. But in 2020, this paper appeared in The Lancet. Same group, Nicolas Brechon was the first author of both papers, and they compared 82 ECMO patients, similar numbers to the pediatric study from Critical Care I shared earlier, with 130 controls who were not supported on ECMO. All of these patients had septic cardiomyopathy, although we don't have a good definition of that. Uh, if we accept it as a severe uh, refractory cardiogenic shock from an infectious cause, and despite the fact that the ECMO patients had worse shock, higher anotrope doses, uh, they had higher 90-day survival. So this is the last word, to my knowledge, uh, for the use of ECMO in adult septic shock to date, which does support its use in very selected patients. And after this study was published, we got together with a group uh, internationally and did uh, a similar systematic review and meta-analysis, but in adult septic shock. And this time we used individual participate uh, participant data. And you can see that the survival in adult patients was 36%, so not nearly as good as in children. But if you looked at the group who had profound uh, low cardiac output states, so those with a low, with a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 20%, those patients did much better than those who had preserved left ventricular ejection. And their mortality uh, was comparable to, to that in children. So at present, where do we stand about the role of ECMO and septic shock? And um, <clears throat> on the left, we have what really my opinion is uh, in children, and this is not supported by a great deal of evidence, uh, but this is where I think, after a long experience with this, is where I would start considering it in children. And this was published in the most recent uh, edition of the Elsewhere Red Book, which was uh, published late last year. 
In the right column, we see the criteria for adult patients, and this is not my opinion. These are the inclusion criteria of the study by Nicola Brescio published in The Lancet three years ago. So this perhaps gives some guidance as to when we should start considering the use of ECMO for adult septic shock. Also from uh, the chapter, which this entire chapter on the use of ECMO for septic shock in the edition of the Red Book, uh, it just shows the different considerations about cannulation strategies which may be applicable and the risks and benefits of each. Again, we don't have time to go through this in detail, but just to let you know, uh, this is a source for those of you who may be interested to read further. So in the study by Brescio in The Lancet, I had the privilege of being asked to write the editorial, and I concluded this way, that ECMO is highly specialized, that a septic cardiomyopathy, particularly in adult patients, is a rare presentation of a common illness, and that none of us, even working in busy ECMO centers, are going to see this frequently. But in those patients we do, who are usually young adults, this could be life-saving. Thank you very much. Um, big thanks to you, sir, for your excellent presentation. I will have the question sessions uh, later. In the so, uh, polytrauma is a major killer all over the world. Especially in India, we see a lot of polytrauma. We have with us So we have with us Dr. Muhammad Azam, who is a consultant of trauma emergency medical care medicine and the director of national ECMO program in Saudi Ministry of Health. He is also a steering committee member of the SWAC. He is interested specifically in trauma and disaster medicine and so he will be talking to us about only trauma patients who need when and how to use ECMO in those patients. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this introduction, and I thank the Scientific and Organizing Committee for inviting me to speak in the SWAG ELSU 2023. My name is Mohammed Azam. I'm a traumatologist, emergency physician, and a critical care physician from Saudi Arabia. And I'll be talking today about polytrauma patient needs ECMO, when and how. I have no conflict of interest and nothing to disclose regarding this uh, lecture or this topic. Uh, I like to start every trauma talk that I talk about by saying that I did my fellowship in uh, McGill University uh, as a trauma fellow. Uh, the reason I did this fellowship is I'm a low IQ person and this is a low IQ fellowship. Uh, the reason I say that, and I hope nobody gets offended because I am one of them, uh, is trauma is a system-based uh, management. Uh, yes, you have to have a lot of good background, medical uh, background and excellent skills to manage this patient, but it is a very well-organized, systemized uh, uh, management for this patient. If you succeed in doing that, uh, usually they, you have a good outcome. It is still a, a, the leading cause of death in developing countries. Uh, the trial of death remains coagulopathy, hypothermia and metabolic acidosis uh, and the leading cause of death in traumatic brain injury patient is hypotension and hypoxia. Mortality rate of trauma patient during the years remained uh, uh, between 15 to 20 percent. These are patients with the injury severity score more than 16 which shows that this is a significant injury. Uh, leading cause of respiratory failure in a trauma patient is severe chest trauma traumatic pulmonary contusion, and pneumonia. Uh, the leading cause of cardiac failure in trauma patient is blunt cardiac contusions, severe pulmonary contusion, and prolonged or and delayed resuscitation, which lead to metabolic acidosis, mainly lactic acidosis, which lead to cardiac dysfunction and cardiac failure. To go back to what I mentioned before, uh, it's a systemized uh, uh, management so knowing your goals of treatment and trauma patient are important and not doing them will cause the complication so you have to resuscitate them early uh, specifically with blood you have to control the breathing very early uh, surgically or 
with medication or with intervention in radiology, prevent hypothermia, prevent hypoxia, and prevent hypotension. Because if you don't do that, if you don't resuscitate them early, you'll go into coagulopathy, multi-organ failure. If you don't control the bleeding fast, you go into hypotension and all the complications you know of hypotension. If you don't prevent hypothermia, also you cause cardiopathy and cardiac dysfunction and arrhythmias. And if you don't uh, prevent hypoxia, you increase the mortality of traumatic brain injury and cause multi-organ failure. And the same thing for preventing hypotension, which can cause the same problems. But we all face this patient where you had a very, very difficult patient, multiple trauma, multiple injuries, head trauma, chest, abdomen, needing to go to the OR, intervention radiology, developing ERDS after, getting massive transfusion. Despite that you do everything that you can, still these patients are very sick and usually they die. So my topic is about ECMO and trauma. Uh, and I would like to talk about ECMO in general. So, you know, the ELSO registry publishes its report and shows the survival rate of uh, but, uh, the ECMO patient in general, whether they're a traumatic patient or pneumonia or viruses. Uh, and uh, these patients have good survival, especially in the pulmonary uh, ECMO patients, up to 60%, and uh, different ages of uh, adult pediatric and neonate, but all they have uh, excellent survival rate. And the service is becoming more uh, popular and it's increasing by every year. The number of runs are exceeding almost now 196,000 from the ELSA registry, and including all type of runs. I wanted to start my lecture by actually talking about what are the indications that we think that might work in trauma patients if we want to use ECMO in trauma patients. Traumatic ARDS, lung cardiac injury with cardiogenic shock, tracheobronchial injuries, correction of acidosis, which again, there is no really good evidence, but this is a theory, and rewarming our trauma patients. Now, if we look at the first three, we will find that these are actually indication for general ECMO patient. So traumatic ARDS, it's just an ARDS that the cause is trauma, and it might be better uh, it might have better outcome comparing to other types of ARDS, but still, it, it is the ARDS and the indication to put an ECMO patient, a trauma patient on ECMO for ARDS is the same as any other ARDS indication. Same for the second cause, which is cardiogenic shock. Whatever is the cause is, but it's still we're putting the ECMO for cardiogenic shock, not specifically for trauma patients. Contraindication, bleeding, I added bleeding here. Uh, although a lot of literature doesn't mention bleeding as a contraindication, but if you have someone who's bleeding, uh, uh, he needs to go to the operating room rather than putting him on an ECMO. Uh, irreversible injuries or damage and terminal diseases, which is rare in trauma patients, as usually they are young people and uh, young uh, healthy patients and others. <clears throat> there is no ECMO talk or an ECMO and trauma talk. You will you'll not see this. Uh, uh, picture. This is the first trauma ECMO patient it was done by Dr. Hill in 1972. Uh, severe chest trauma patient was put on the Bramson membrane lung machine, and this patient survived. These are case reports and case series uh, during the years from 1972 up to 2008, uh, 18, sorry, and it looked at. ECMO and trauma patient. And as you can see on the side here, survival rates varies between 100%, 28%, depends on the study, depends on the case series, depends on the reason. There's a lot of heterogeneity in these studies uh, and you cannot compare one to each other. And unfortunately, because ECMO literature and trauma patients uh, doesn't have really uh, strong evidence because most of the studies are case reports or case series. But this is a summary of all the 
lecture, uh, research that has been done in the field. If I want to ask questions that are important in a trauma patient, so my, my question, my first question is when? So when I put the trauma patient on ECMO, and, and, and again, there is not really a strong uh, evidence or really good uh, recommendation to mention that. We'll go through my lecture in the next couple of slides, but that's an important question that needs a good answer so we can know when to apply ECMO in trauma patient. Uh, which mode? Should it be VV ECMO? Should it be VA ECMO? Uh, still no clear answer. Should I anticoagulate them? Should I uh, not anticoagulate them? And how long should I keep them on ECMO? The American Association of Trauma of Sur Surgery for Trauma uh, wrote this uh, clinical consensus and tried to answer a couple of these questions. And I'll share these questions and answer with you just to show you that still there is no clear answer for uh, when to use ECMO in trauma patients. So the first question they asked, when is ECMO use appropriate in trauma patient? And the recommendation was, it can be considered for partial or for support in cases of potentially reversible post-traumatic cardiopulmonary failure. So it is a general um, recommendation. So if you, you either can use it as partial or for support and in reversible post-traumatic cardiopulmonary failure, but with no specific explanation. Which method of ECMO, VD or VA, is more appropriate for trauma patients? Mode of ECMO should be based on the patient disease process. Those with only respiratory failure or shock reasonably thought to be caused by severe hypoxia should be candidate for VV ECMO. Those with respiratory or refractory cardiac dysfunction or cardiogenic shock should be placed on VA ECMO. Again, very general uh, recommendation. A single lumen cannulation or dual, dual lumen cannulation appropriate for trauma patient requiring VV ECMO. Either cannulation technique is appropriate and should be based on the clinical comfort of the cannulator and the ECMO team goal. So which traumatic diagnoses can be considered for ECMO therapy? In trauma patient, no specific diagnosis are absolute indication or contraindication indication to ECMO therapy, other than irreversible injury. Individual decision regarding anatomy, physiology, and risk benefit of ECMO need to be taken into account. So the very important question we all ask, what is the appropriate anticoagulation strategy for ECMO in the trauma population? Should we anticoagulate them? Should we not anticoagulate them? And the answer is, the minimal amount of anticoagulation should be used to support the trauma patient on ECMO. And in the literature, there is heterogeneity in the recommendation where people suggest or recommend to use anticoagulation or, uh, from the beginning or not to anticoagulate them at all uh, through the whole ECMO run or to not anticoagulate them in the beginning of the run, but after a couple of days when the bleeding is controlled, maybe start uh, anticoagulation on a lower dose with lower targets. This is systemic review was done uh, recently, and it, they reviewed almost 7,600 7, um, uh, reports in the literature, uh, after exclusion publication and uh, studies that uh, did not match the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, the paper included 58 uh, papers. All of them were retrospective studies and case reports. It included total of uh, 500, 548 patients. 90 percent of them were adults, and 80 percent were male. Mean age was 34.9, and that's uh, normal because uh, these are trauma patients, so they're usually young. The main cause of the trauma was blunt in 90% of the patient, and 10% uh, were penetrating trauma. 68% had severe chest trauma, and the overall mortality of all these patients were 30. Put in mind, uh, there was a wide 
range of the mortality between the studies from zero almost to seventy uh, percent, and that's the, this is a big uh, heterogeneity in the in the study. The modes of uh, that has been used in the study uh, were BV ECMO about seventy percent, BA ECMO about thirty percent. Uh, conversion rate between BV to BA was about two percent and BA to BV about 0.4 percent. Uh, there was about 4.2 percent uh, missing type, so there was the studies did not uh, say what type of uh, ECMO that they used. The duration of ECMO was 9.6 days, so there may be one of the uh, recommendations that we can see in a trauma patient, usually they don't need to stay on ECMO for a long time, uh, and that may be a good uh, thing, so we don't have them uh, running into complication with longer stay on the ECMO. Um, and also, it, uh, it's been suggested from literature that early start of uh, ECMO in trauma patients, specifically when you're supporting respiratory uh, causes, uh, have better benefit and uh, decrease the chances of having ventilator-related uh, lung injuries and complication related to hypoxia. <clears throat> the complication rate in, these, in the studies that has been in this system, uh, systematic review uh, had uh, bleeding about 22% and ranges from cannula side bleeding to intra-abdominal bleeding to intracranial bleeding, uh, surgical side bleeding. But uh, they did not really mention each one of them, uh, what is the percentage of each one of them, and how major was the bleed, uh, did it uh, affect uh, mortality or not. Uh, also, they had uh, thrombotic events, about 19%, which was uh, different uh, types of thrombotic events, some of them related to the membrane itself, and some of them related to the patient. Other complication that has been seen of ischemic lower ischemia and lower extremity, uh, lower extremity, sorry, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, brain swelling, acute lung edema, pancreatitis, uh, accidental removal of cannula, one case, pseudoaneurysm at the site of the cannula. Uh, and there was other seven complications that were not recorded uh, in the study or what type of uh, complication. Their conclusion was our systemic review illustrates that ECMO has been gradually utilized in a life-saving capacity in patients with severe trauma, and the, and the feasibility and advantage of this technique are becoming widely accepted. However, the safety and effectiveness of ECMO in trauma require further study. Several problems with ECMO trauma, including the role of VA, the time to institute the ECMO, uh, and the anticoagulation strategy remain controversial and must be solved in the future studies. Indeed, clinical randomized clonal, uh, control trial with large sample and long term survival data are needed. So, even with this large systematic review, still there is a lot of questions to be answered regarding the usefulness of ECMO in trauma patients. However, it sounds that there is a chance. Or there is uh, a future for ECMO trauma patient, and but at the time being, without prospective studies or being difficult to have randomized clinical trials in such a patient, but uh, uh, at least uh, with the matching studies between uh, ECMO trauma patient and patient who are similar to them without ECMO, what are the different in outcome? Maybe it will help to answer a lot of the questions that I mean I mentioned at the beginning: when to put them on ECMO which mode that we put them on ECMO, should we antigolate or not, when to remove them on ECMO. So my take-home message, ECMO and trauma may be considered, however, no evidence to support with or against at the time being. But if you're going to use ECMO in trauma patients, use the conventional ECMO indication, contraindication that we use in respiratory and cardiac uh, cases uh, that is not trauma, Use them early, if you're going to use, use it early, and come out early. Use higher flow so to prevent uh, clotting in the membrane uh, or in the cannulas or in the patient. Uh, use larger cannulas, 
And the anticoagulation really it depends on uh, the risk and benefit uh, of your patient. Uh, if you think that they have high risk of bleed, then don't anticoagulate them at least for the first couple of days until you're sure that the patient is uh, is uh, controlled in terms of his bleeding and it's not going to get worse. And then you can anticoagulate them with very strict uh, uh, follow up and monitoring with ACTs and P PTDs. There is, there is cases in the literature that actually ran off anticoagulation for more than 15 days. So it, 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 you can run ECMO without uh, putting them on anticoagulation for a longer period of time. And by that, I end my lecture and I thank you for your invitation and I'm open to any question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we will have questions at the end of the session. The last, the last talk of today's session will be presented by Dr. Daniel Brody. He's a professor of medicine at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He wears multiple hats. He is a president elect of Extracorporeal Lifesaver Association organization and uh, is chairperson of uh, ECMO Network Committee. My name is uh, Dan. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today at this uh, conference uh, put on by the SPOC also, as well as uh, the annual national conference of the ECMO Society of India. Um, it's really a privilege uh, to be able to speak to you, and I, I only wish I could be there with you uh, in person, uh, hopefully uh, for the next conference. Um, I was asked to speak about obesity uh, in the setting of, of ECMO for ARDS and whether or not it is a contraindication. Uh, to using uh, ECMO in that setting. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, not directly relevant, except that uh, I'm the president elect and also and chair of the International ECMO Network. Um, so let's talk about obesity for a second. Obesity, uh, as everyone knows, is an epidemic, and uh, the prevalence has tripled worldwide since 1975, truly uh, a major phenomenon in the world today. Um, as of 2016, it was estimated that 650 million adults uh, in the world uh, had obesity, 13% uh, of the entire world's population, and that the vast majority of overweight or obese children actually now live in developing countries. There are many consequences for obesity that we're familiar with, uh, as you can see here, and ultimately that contributes to all-cause mortality. Uh, some of the consequences of obesity, more than 4 million deaths per year were reported in 2017 that were attributed uh, to overweight or obesity. Um, and are overweight or obesity have been linked to more deaths worldwide than being underweight. What about obesity specifically in the ICU? Well, obviously, yes, it's an increasing proportion of uh, the population, uh, so too it is an increasing proportion of the patients admitted to the ICU. And early studies suggested that obesity was associated with mortality uh, in the ICU. However, uh, in the last decade, more recent literature suggested what has become known as the obesity paradox. But actually, uh, obese patients may have better outcomes in the ICU. Uh, with regard to ARDS in particular, there's an increased risk for ARDS, and yet there's lower ARDS-specific mortality, which we'll uh, discuss uh, later on in the talk. So what about ECMO for ARDS in general? Well, we now have a fair amount of evidence suggesting that we can uh, uh, reliably uh, do this and uh, improve mortality in our patients. And it has become part of the uh, the standard algorithm is from uh, Daryl Abrams in uh, Lancet Respiratory Medicine. So uh, within that algorithm, if we're using uh, ECMO, should obesity be considered a contraindication to ECMO uh, in ARDS? And that is really the central uh, question here. Uh, also, guidelines uh, from years ago, uh, as well as other literature, have suggested that obesity is a relative contraindication. And why? Uh, partly because cannulation may be more difficult, uh, transport and mobilization may be more difficult, and there's a potential requirement for higher blood flow rates and concern for worse outcomes. Um, does data support excluding patients with obesity? Well, first of all, is transport really an issue? And this uh, was a paper uh, led for us by uh, Michael Salma, where we looked at 63 obese patients who were transported uh, with ECMO, uh, 28 with a BMI greater than 40, and six of them even had a BMI greater than 50. There were no deaths during transport, and BMI was not a predictor of in-hospital mortality. What about cannulation? Uh, this is a very nice uh, paper from uh, Regensburg, uh, looking at over a decade of experience with 153 patients whose BMI was greater than 35, cannulated per percutaneously for ECLS, uh, the majority of them VV, um, and there was no difference in outcomes or complications compared with normal weight patients. 
is there a signal in the veno arterial population here at 244 uh, patient observational study looking at VA for cardiogenic shock? And there was no significant difference in the hospital mortality between uh, the obese and the non-obese, um, although they noticed a signal for increased mortality with class 2 obesity. Uh, here, another single center observational study, 355 VA patients for cardiogenic shock, and no significant difference in hospital survival. Uh, another uh, VA population, 431 patients, overall survival is 48%, with no difference based on BMI, except in the population uh, that received the eCPR. And this is uh, led by Michael Soma again from our center. Uh, looking specifically at eCPR, here's a, 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 a paper looking at uh, 200 patients who received uh, eCPR. Only 15% of those patients, though, had a BMI greater than or equal to 30. Um, and in this small study, BMI was not associated with any hospital mortality. But we really don't have a lot of evidence, uh, particularly in the ECPR population. Uh, of course, our focus today is going to be on obesity with BB ECMO. Um, this from uh, Zach Cohn, 55 patients from a single center receiving ECMO for ARDS now. Um, and survival at hospital discharge was 67%. If the BMI was greater than 40, 58% if it was less than 40. Um, and it happens to be that if the BMI was greater than uh, 50, and those uh, six patients all survived. Uh, here, 194 patients in a single center study with no difference uh, based on BMI. Uh, and again, here, 233 patients, mostly VA, with no difference in 30 day uh, mortality in, uh, for any BMI group, either VA or VP. Uh, but there was an increased risk of leading with the peripheral VA cannulation if the BMI was greater than 35. Uh, anything specific to COVID 19 related ARDS here, 76 patients, uh, 90 day survival, 51%. And the higher BMI was associated with actually higher 90-day survival, so giving us a, a taste that perhaps uh, we will see that trend. Uh, here are another 119 patients. This is Martin Ballot and colleagues. Uh, ECMO for COVID-19-related ARDS, 58% of them obese, and there was no difference in survival. So there seems to be no difference in survival in these single-center observational studies, but what about multi-center studies? Uh, here is an uh, earlier study on the Journal of Critical Care, uh, this is 11 hospitals in South Korea, 84 patients with BB ECMO for pneumonia. Um, BMI less than 25 was compared to BMI greater than or equal to 25. Uh, only 26 patients actually had a BMI of at least 25, and those were termed obese. Uh, and the six-month survival was uh, considerably better in those with the higher BMI. But I'm not sure this really counts as the obesity paradox because it's not clearly an obese population. Uh, what about larger databases? This is uh, data from the nationwide uh, readmissions database. This is uh, Penn and Benrosh's uh, group. Uh, retrospectively, looking at 23,000 uh, ECLS cases, 1,900 obese patients, and obesity was not associated with increased odds of mortality. What about the ELSA registry? Uh, here's an earlier paper um, uh, by Priya Nair's group uh, looking at the ELSA registry, 1,300 patients. Uh, with VV ECMO, this is an earlier study, 2005 to 2011. There was no significant difference in the in hospital mortality based on body weight, not BMI per se, but body weight, uh, and no difference in a subset of patients with influenza A, H1N1. Um, here uh, is a recent paper from Intensive Care Medicine, excellent uh, paper that uh, now forms the, the best data that we have so far, uh, looking at the ELSA registry uh, and the impact of BMI on outcomes. Uh, and they look specifically at the impact of BMI greater than or equal to 35 using propensity score matching, inverse propensity score weighting, and multivariate analysis. Uh, the size of the uh, cohort is much larger because it's also registry, 18,500 patients. Um, BMI is uh, greater than or equal to 35, and this study is associated with decreased in hospital mortality, uh, as well as decreased hospital length of stay. Um, there was no relationship between BMI and outcomes uh, in terms of. Uh, 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 excuse me, the, the relationship between BMI and outcomes was nonlinear, and there was no specific cutoff for so called utility of ECMO in this population. Uh, the issues that uh, remain to be addressed after this study uh, 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 concern the fact that it was a registry study with significant missing data, heterogeneity of the population, and that it was all respiratory failure and not ARDS specific. And the analysis used a BMI cutoff of uh, 35 or class 2 obesity rather than 30. So that brings us to uh, unpublished data that uh, I'll present today from the multicenter ECMO obesity study. This was led for us by Daria Ludum and Tai Pham. Uh, it's an international multicenter retrospective cohort study uh, uh, with an association between uh, looking at the association between obesity and mortality in ECMO for ARDS. Uh, and this is using a BMI cutoff of uh, 30 and uh, WHO definitions. 
It's ICU mortality in 774 ECMO patients for ARDS, 320 of them with obesity, uh, between July 2012 through June 2017. Um, the initial analysis has excluded underweight patients, but that can change. Uh, this is from the University of Milan in Italy, Columbia University in the United States, Duke University in the United States, and Assistance uh, Publique Hôpital de Paris uh, in France, as well as the Lifeguards uh, Study Database, which included 23 ICUs from 10 countries. Uh, the analyses were a multivariable logist logistic regression, propensity score matching, uh, using BMI as a continuous variable per uh, kilogram uh, per meter squared, as well as per three kilograms per meter squared, and uh, looking at the continuous association between BMI and mortality, using penalized linear splines to allow for non-linear associations. The primary outcome is ICU mortality. Uh, in the obese, uh, the patients with obesity was 24.1% versus the uh, patients without obesity where it was 34.8% with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.648 favoring obesity. Uh, BMI as a continuous variable, uh, multi-variable regression, higher BMI is associated with decreased ICU mortality. The propensity score matching of 258 uh, patients with obesity versus 258 without, obesity had uh, significantly lower mortality. Um, here you can see the linear splines uh, modeling BMI uh, this way uh, showed a somewhat U-shaped curve with the lowest risk of death plateauing between uh, a BMI of 50 to 55. Uh, as compared with the ELSA registry study, the relationship between BMI and outcomes uh, where it was nonlinear, there was a higher mortality uh, BMI 30 to 35 versus in this study, there was a higher mortality in BMI either less than 25 or greater than 55. In secondary outcomes, there were no differences in ICU and hospital length of stay, duration of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO, or ECMO free days and 90 days. Uh, patients with obesity did have fewer ventilator free days and hospital free days. So when thinking about ECMO free RDS, patients with obesity had lower ICU mortality than patients without obesity using both multivariable and propensity score matching analyses. So is this an example then of the ICU obesity paradox? And that thinking about the hypotheses for that paradox for a minute will give us a sense. Um, here, uh, the, the three of the uh, hypotheses that have been proposed are that there's preconditioning uh, cloud of obesity, meaning that the adipose-induced inflammatory cytokines um, can dampen subsequent inflammatory response to injury. Uh, that and or uh, transformation of adipose macrophages from the inflammatory M type to anti inflammatory M, uh, excuse me, M1 type to M2 during critical illness and or higher nutritional stores, which protect against severe energy expenditure during critical illness. But there might be factors specific to ARDS. Um, in in uh, patients with obesity, the increased chest wall elastics of obese patients may mitigate against ventilator induced lung injury. Higher plateau pressures generated with similar event settings uh, may prompt lowering of ventilator volumes and pressures in these obese patients that clinicians who are reacting to that higher plateau pressure, but the plateau pressure may not be the best surrogate for actual transpulmonary pressure in patients with obesity. Um, in very severe ARDS, the increase in pleural pressure and the decrease in functional residual capacity can result in increased atelectasis. So the so-called severity of ARDS in these patients may be relatively overestimated. And think about it, if they have more atelectasis, they're gonna have a lower P to F uh, without necessarily having more damage to the lungs. Uh, so at comparable PDF ratios, uh, they may have less severe ARDS pathology. And so you may expect both the atelectasis and the overall state of that patient to be more reversible, where mortality could be expected to be less. Um, we see that uh, in our study, the median peak uh, with obesity is 15, without obesity is 13. So perhaps um, there's even a greater opportunity to utilize peak in these patients uh, with obesity. Uh, here's a, a separate study by Salvatore Grasso published in Intensive Care Medicine. So they looked at 14 patients with influenza H1N1 associated ARDS who were referred for ECMO. And they used esophageal pressure monitor, monitoring to target a transpulmonary pressure close to the upper physiologic limit. And in seven patients who were near the physiologic limit who received ECMO, and there were seven patients below the limit who then received increased heat until they reached that limit, oxygenation improvement all set and avoided ECMO. So this is the point, is that there may be an opportunity uh, to reverse some of these patients, and they may not have needed ECMO as much as other patients with comparable PDF ratios. So is it actually the obesity paradox, or are we potentially overcalling the severity of ARDS in these patients with obesity and potentially underutilizing HEAP? So ultimately, uh, obesity may complicate cannulation, transport, and mobilization. 
uh, in select patients and in, at some centers. And obesity in, the, in and of itself, though, uh, may be associated with nonetheless with a lower mortality, and so it should not be considered uh, a contraindication to ECMO or ARDS. Thank you very much. After that interesting session of Pennsylvania topics, I would like to invite the audience for one or two questions. Any questions for the speakers? Yes, sir. Dr. Ram, uh, as you say that you don't, I mean, you initiate uh, air day, I mean, what do you call it? You initiate ECMO in a pretty late stage in young adults, right? And your results are not so good in young adults. At the same time, you say that LBEF, if it is less than 20, your results are better. How do you correlate both? And why don't you start early ECMO in sepsis? Thank you. <coughs> I'm sorry. And I couldn't hear the first two thirds of the question. Are you able to repeat it? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that you start uh, ECMO pretty late in young adults, number one. And number two, yeah. and you say that when your LBEF is less than 20, your results are better. How do you correlate both? And why don't you start early ECMO in case of young adults with sepsis? Thank you. Are you am I okay, thank you. These are very good questions and not easy to answer uh, simply. I don't propose that we start ECMO late. If you're going to use ECMO, there's overwhelming evidence that the earlier you use it, the better. My point with that was that in that study, which was just of children, not adults, that there was a defined cutoff at 47.1% using the model that we had uh, had uh, developed, that if you put the children on ECMO who had a less than predicted mortality of 47%, putting them on ECMO did worse. In other words, all you did was expose them to the complications of ECMO without giving them any benefit. But above, that was the inflection point. If, you, if they had a predicted risk of death above 47.1%, and you put them on ECMO, then they did better. Now, this is one study, it's one model. Clearly, we can't use this in clinical practice because it hasn't been validated, and it probably isn't discriminating enough. But I think the principle is true. That doesn't mean that we should watch patients get worse and worse and worse and not prepare and plan and talk to our ECMO team about when to cannulate. I'm not advocating that at all. On the other hand, we risk, if you have this approach that, oh, everybody has to go on ECMO early, then you risk putting patients on ECMO who wouldn't actually need it in the first place. The second point to your question was about left ventricular ejection fraction. Clearly, ECMO primarily is designed as life support for the failing heart or lung. And therefore, the greater the ventricular dysfunction, perhaps, the, the stronger the role of ECMO. And we see this because on the whole, pediatric outcomes um, using ECMO for septic shock are substantially better. And I think part of that is because um, the children, young children, their primary hemodynamic manifestation of sepsis is the myocardial depression. You know, the enemy in pediatric intensive care is vasoconstriction. The enemy in adult intensive care is usually vasodilation. And using an intervention such as ECMO for somebody with profound vasoplegia and mitochondrial dysfunction We've seen in those studies done in places like Korea and Taiwan. I mean, there are lots of things we could talk about those studies, but essentially what they've done is put them on ECMO, often with very low flow, maybe 1.5 liters a minute through femoral cannulation in somebody with distributive shock. So again, that exposes them to all the risks of ECMO without any of the potential benefits. And I think that systematic review that came out, which highlighted this point, um, supports this view. I also just add that one of the chairs I see before me is Dr. Ramanathan, who was one of the key authors in the study. I don't know whether he also wishes to, to comment about this, but thank you for the question. Thanks, Brad. Uh, uh, the, your question was uh, about the timeline of septic cardiomyopathy uh, happening late in the context of 
patient in septic shock. Um, you need to understand that septic cardiomyopathy happens only in a subset of patients and you cannot predict which subset of patients would uh, essentially benefit from it. So that's that's always the clinical conundrum you face and that's where you know you your your uh, consideration of a VA ECMO as a mechanical cardiac support early in every patient with septic shock might not be possible. Uh, did I answer your question? Thank you. Oh, okay, all right. I'm sorry, we could take only one question. This was an interesting first session on ECMO in specific situations. We heard speakers talking on ECMO in pregnancy, septic shock, obesity, and trauma. We have more interesting sessions to come. I think you know we'll 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 stop here and go for the next one. More than happy to take all your questions later on during breaks. Thanks. Thank you, respected speakers and moderators, for sharing your valuable knowledge with us.